everybody. I want to welcome you to, um, to our session this afternoon. So we are talking about staying woke in a time of backlash. And our guest speaker is Ms. Shelja Tori, a social worker, secretary of the Southern Burlington County NAACP, and executive director of DION, which is short for Diversity and Equality and Equal Opportunity Network, a nonprofit addressing systemic racism and socioeconomic disparities within education, and an activist. Ms. Tori is a 2022 winner of the Outstanding Women of Burlington County Award for her outstanding work in diversity and inclusion. And Ms. Ms. Tori, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Why isn't this turning? I would like to um, acknowledge the Lenny Lenape people as the traditional landowners of New Jersey that we're meeting on today and some of you have joined from home. I recognise the continuing connection to the land, waters and culture and I pay my respects to the people's past, present and emerging throughout the Lenape di diaspora I extend my respect and acknowledgement to all Indigenous people across Northern America and recognise the continued challenges and injustices faced today. In addition, I also want to mention that I do stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You guys have been in the room for a while, I know, um, and I just heard I have a whole hour of you um, having to be entertained by me and I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna tell you why in a moment. So just before I do, um, my name is Shelja Tori. Uh, I do go by she, her. Firstly, I wanna say thank you so much to Dr. Nadine Sullivan, who um, the coordinator of this amazing course that I understand you're all doing. And I hope that it, I hope I get great feedback about it as well. And I just want to say thank you for allowing the opportunity and the honour to be here. So, who am I and what am I doing here? Now, this is my bio. I'm not going to read it to you, so don't worry. Um, okay, I'm gonna, not going to go with the fancy stuff. I'm going to go kind of with more of the fun stuff. So, all you need to know is that I'm legit and I'm gonna name the elephant in the room because apparently I have an accent. <laughs> I just want you all to know that I don't think I have an accent. I actually think you have an accent. Um, and, and look, that's okay, but I just wanted to name that. So if you were thinking, oh, if you were thinking, um, is she from England? Oh, I see some no's. I see a couple of maybes. Now, if you did say, if you did think British, I would have said, I am related to Prince Harry, but I'm not. I'm and if you thought that I'm Australian, you're correct. Who thought I was Australian? Okay, so cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I am born and raised in Australia. I believe you call it the land down under. Uh, well, I think the rest of it, the world calls it that, but um, here it means something else, so we're not going to call it that. Um, and so, I am a long way from home. I um, always grew up thinking that this is the mighty USA, and I never thought in a million years that I would be living here. I never thought, um, you know, I always thought that this is where Hollywood is, this is where like the stars are born, uh, this is where the NBA is, cool. Um, and then you guys also wear some like weird um, stuff for football. We don't do that over there, I just want you to know that. Um, but you know, in the last eight years that I've lived here, I have come to realize the misconception of what I believed my whole life about America. And that's okay, that's okay, don't be disappointed. I won't tell you what everyone else outside of America thinks, doesn't matter. We're going to talk about now and what's going on. So, much like though, the misconception that you may have of Australia. Does anyone have any, you know, wh when you think of Australia, what do you think? Aborigines. Aborigines, see, see, we. I was going to say kangaroos. <laughs> I was going to say spiders. Okay, all right. So, I knew someone would mention kangaroos. I was thinking koalas. 
And I definitely knew somebody was going to bring up the spiders because it's always the first thing we're going to get. Um, and I'm really excited that you know who Aborigines are. Uh, sadly, across the world, uh, that is not necessarily a known fact about um, Australia. And yes, I did have kangaroos in my backyard once. Um, we do have a lot of the world's most dangerous spiders that are probably going to kill you. It's so fun. I mean, fun is a word, yeah. <laughs> we do have, now I am terrified of snakes personally. Um, I'll go swim in the ocean, there's sharks in there. I will probably walk around and there's spiders there, but like it's the snakes that I'm terrified of because we have a snake called the brown snake. And the brown snake doesn't just run away because they're scared of you, they're going to chase you. So, snakes. We might have them, but to our defense, you guys have this thing that's called a skunk that's yeah. not actually like a, just a cartoon character, like that's real. <laughs> wow, um, that was interesting. And then you have these killer bears that just come hang out in your yeah. pool during the day. So that's to our defense. I just, I got you Australia. I know there's some family watching, I, I got you, don't worry. So yeah, I just wanted to clear that up. Um, however, however, um, also in Australia, we like to use nicknames, right? So it's very, it's, it really is. We really are like down to earth people and we're pretty laid back and fairly relaxed. Um, probably does take a lot to really like ruffle my feathers. And if you're there, you've achieved something very big, but I want to share a little bit about my story and I want to talk to you about some of the things that we have um, that was on this, this flyer, of course. So I want to share that my first nickname in Australia at four and a half years old um, was Blackie. This is very confusing for a brown girl who like grew up with all these loving brown people and I genuinely thought that either I had learned colour names wrong or that, like they just didn't know what they were talking about. I'm like, what is happening? I it was brown. Okay, all right. So, you know. Now, here's the thing, though. When you've got a small child who's been around their family, has grown up with so much love and doesn't actually know that they're different, kind of after a while, you realise, oh, my God, I think I might be different. But as a four and a half year old, you don't really understand why like, now I grew up in like the 90s, so um, there was no social distancing and you know, so we had to hold hands in kindergarten. You had to line up in two straight lines and hold hands and nobody wanted to hold my hand because I was blacky and if they touched me, they might get my skin on them or something. And I was like, is that what happens to us? Like really, do we shed or something? And you know, I never really understood it. So I was like, all right, like whatever. But on top of that, so now I'm top of like going, okay, when I grow up, maybe I'll just like become white. Like I think, cause that's, that then I'll fit in and everyone will want to hold my hand and I'll have friends and I won't be like, you know, laughed at or like called these weird names that I've never heard of, but they're all pointing and laughing. On top of that, my kindergarten teacher, who I found out later in life was actually identified herself as a lesbian. Sadly, um, Miss Masters, yeah, I'm calling you out. She did not take the time to learn my name. Not from me and not from my mum or my dad or my older sibling. Um, she, so Shelja, apparently, I think it's fairly easy and yeah, I get it. Sometimes you need to hear someone's name twice. I actually, uh, she called me Soldier and for in Australia, schools are broken up into um, kindergarten to grade six, and then from grade seven to 12 is high school. That's it, it's just two, there's no middle school. Um, and it doesn't, it's not based on your district either. I'll get, I'll get to that. So now I have to choose, do you wanna grow up and be white or do you wanna change your name? Like, cause you could change your name. And like, I begged my parents to just change my name. Like, why can't you just call me like Rebecca or something? I'm so grateful, mum and dad, for not changing my name. Thank you for not changing my name. However, from kindergarten to year six, of course, sorry, grade six, as you say, uh, that followed me, so soldier. 
Also, at the time, it just so happened, there was a commercial on TV for cold and flu tablets. And you take this cold and flu tablet and then you can soldier on. And they would march because they were soldiering on because these tablets cured them. Well, guess what? I didn't really like that song. And every time I'd hear it on the TV, I'd get really upset because there were people in school for many, many years singing that to me. And again, I was just like, oh my God, like my name's not Soldier, but okay, whatever. And so I just went into myself. Now, people who know me now do not believe me when I say that I'm, I was an introvert and I was really shy and I didn't talk and I didn't maintain my eye contact. Um, I know that my people that are watching are laughing at that, they don't believe me, but, I talk about my early days as a child because this is going to make sense as to how that shaped me into the person I am and to the grown woman I am today. So I know that you um, read the flyer and you read, you know, the advertisement of like, what's, what's this about? What are we going to do? And the word woke was on it, right? So speaking about, I can't see myself, just so you know. Um, speaking about today, you know, the word woke was used. I was like, ooh, it's a little controversial for a college, public college. Okay. All right. So I'm thinking, okay, well, we can, we can do that. Um, now, I have come to learn that there are different, like, opinions. That A lot of my stuff here in America has been from things that I've taught myself, that I've learnt myself um, because I have an interest in it. Um, and a lot of it is also some, some observations, particularly over the last few years. So some people think that that's a great word. And then there are other people that think that it triggers them and then it, they become almost aggressive. And it, okay, each to their own. Um, and then there are other people who genuinely are like, well, woke just means I'm not asleep. Pretty simple, right? And for a foreigner like myself, probably would have thought that too if I wasn't, you know, um, if I was living under a rock or something for the last few years. But in saying that, what does the term woke mean in today's world, in today's climate? So woke is a term that has gained um, popularity in the years, right? Uh, particularly more so now. Nobody wants to be labelled as, you know, when, when it's, it's, it's almost thrown as an insult. And it's also become a political statement because you have people going, well, they're just like the far left, right? Is, am, I, am I on the right track here? Yes, sort of, no? Okay, well, um, the real woke people, they actually don't like red or blue. Um, they actually think they're both, you know, fairly not okay. I'm not allowed to swear, am I? Okay, got it. I'm an activist, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and so, look, over time, you know, this has become a word that we throw around for insulting people, um, labeling them and, and putting them in a group. And I've noticed that that is a very common thing here. We like to put people in groups and put them in a box and we need to label them, right? So it's really interesting though, when people just say, well, I just don't understand it. So being woke is an ongoing process though. If you claim to be woke, you don't have all the answers. Because let me tell you, if, if all the woke people had the answers, we'd be okay right now. We wouldn't be the laughing stock of the world. I wouldn't have family saying, why are you living there? Like you have, you've, you've ditched us for, for that, why? Right? So clearly being woke is not about a certain outlook that's going to change over time because we live in a society and society continues to change. So there's always this old saying and it says you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But we can, can't we, right? And a lot of people I'm sure in this room may have even had to unlearn some things or relearn some things or just learn new things. And so it doesn't, learning is not just for children. And so when it comes to talking about being woke, it's really interesting to observe this as an outsider for someone who hasn't grown up learning what all these stereotypes are. I don't know a lot of them. I've literally been here for eight years and there is definitely another language spoken here at times. Um, 
So you're wearing what's called a hoodie. In my country, we call that a jumper. Um, people, it's very, it's really fun going and asking for things in our first year at Walmart and Home Depot. Um, I say aluminium, you say aluminium. I just want to highlight that. So, you know, uh, I started this presentation with a land acknowledgement. And I did that as the very, very first thing that I did, apart from saying thank you. Why is that significant? Why did I do it that way? Why did I not introduce myself first and then do a land acknowledgement? I'll tell you why. Because it's not my right, okay? We're on, we're on someone else's land. And by not acknowledging that, I'm still saying that, hold on, I'll get to you. So it's okay to hold the door open for someone when they're about to walk in and let them go first. It's, it's okay, right? We do that, it's, it's polite, it's kind. So it's okay to not follow the norms of reading my bio to let you know exactly who I am and how qualified I am or am not to be worthy enough to stand in front of you, right? So a land acknowledgement Does that mean if you do a land acknowledgement that you're woke? Come on, give me some sort of reaction. Yes, no, maybe? I think you're a bit, con yep, got your face there. All right, so. What's your purpose with a land acknowledgement is what I'm getting at, right? What we have seen in the last three years the entire world shut down and everyone had to figure out how we were going to continue life with um, education, with work. How do we keep the doors open? How do we keep them closed and safe? And, but we figured it out because we're in 2023 and technology is amazing. You know, now people don't necessarily need to be in this room to hear me speak. Now we can be recorded. They can be online. They can have it on in the background. They can be, you know, doing whatever they need to be doing because life is busy and we know that. It's so going back to my point that society is always changing. So a land acknowledgement, I guess, in, you know, hindsight, it can't just be like what a lot of companies did, a lot of corporations, a lot of political leaders a lot of education entities, they all did a statement. It's a statement of like, I stand in solidarity and I'm gonna fight racism and I'm gonna do a strategic plan. Cool. How's that going in 2023? Where are all those people that signed up to being an ally in 2020? Where'd they go? It, so, I heard there was a thing called um, ally fatigue. That's where they went. I just want you to know they, they burnt out. So where does that leave the people that have to deal with this every day, right? So when it comes to a land acknowledgement, you need to know its purpose. Land acknowledgement at its core is a tool to reverse invisibility, right? These statements, these pledges, these land acknowledgements that you see, they are supposed to be providing information I'm not mad at you though, because you didn't learn this at school. How do I know that? Because I um, grew up with this. Actually, my, most of my professional life, um, I had to learn the land acknowledgement. And let me tell you, we're in New Jersey. At least it's the same people. In Australia, you better know where you're at, because if you're 20 minutes that way, you're on another people's land. So if you're having a meeting, if you're having, um, you know, some people have got so, they understand it so much to the point where they're even using it at parties and weddings, right? Because they, they really do understand it. But again, the purpose. So you can say these things, but, but, Native Amer when you say Native American, sometimes that's seen as the past, but they're still here, right? So some people have even come out and said, I may or may not be one of them. What, what you said in 2020, can you please like, just give us some examples of how you've done that? Well, we, we, we had like implicit bias training and you know, okay. Now we know that now a lot of research and data has actually come out over the last couple of years and we've syndicated, it hasn't really worked now, has it? Do you think it's probably because 
we just, we just, it's just so new and there's just so much going on and it's just so easy to not want to know these things, right? Now, like I said, in Australia, this is regular practice. You can go onto many Australian websites, businesses, private, public, and they will have a little acknowledgement on there um, down at the bottom of the screen. However, you're gonna know if they're legit or not when you actually see the information that they can then provide of how they're affecting that change in that community. So if the questions that you really need to ideally be asking, what is your equity goal here for this statement, this pledge, or the land acknowledgement. You can't just say it and have it there and appear to look like, because we know that's performative now. We had to learn really quickly in the last few years. How do you use a land acknowledgement, um, these, sorry, how do you use land acknowledgements, pledges, statements to fit into those goals? How do you intend to make progress against these goals? How does it relate to programming work that you're currently doing? in class, on campus. Are you holding people accountable? Are you able, do you feel comfortable enough to? How well do you understand the context of true American history? And how does that impact on people now? We're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the, the backlash of that as well. What's the history of the organization that you have worked for in the context of colonialism? What work have you done to build relationships and serve the interests, the people who identify within that community? Okay. What exactly do you have regarding building equity specifically for that community? If you can't answer these questions, you're better off just not doing a statement, not doing a pledge, not doing a land exchange because it's actually more disrespectful. So I mentioned school, not mad, you didn't learn it at school. How, I guess, you know, one of the questions now comes to with what's going on in the world, why and how have schools become the site of backlash against diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? For those of all races, ethnicities, gender, sexual orientation, diversities of abilities, and socioeconomic classes, how, why? Suddenly, Gotta ban some books now. Gonna have to regulate how people you choose to do what they do with their bodies. Isn't that interesting? Uh, who can love who? Who can just just live? And history has indicated that you know that clearly hasn't worked, right? So when you think that you're being so progressive because you've done this statement, but then we're now going to be supporting the bigger when you deeply dive into it, this is the question that you ask. So schools are now the target. And I will say, um, as a foreigner, just based on my observations, I knew that this was gonna come. Re been really distracted, been so distracted by social justice issues. And I'm not at all saying that that's not an issue because it absolutely is. However, when you get distracted by this, there's another system over here that flies under the radar. That system is the education system. Um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, books being banned in other states. I'm talking about right here in New Jersey. So to answer this somewhat, it's rooted in fear, right? People who are working against all of these woke things or whatever else they want to call it, like diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, um, I don't know what it, whatever else you call it. It's rooted in fear of change and change is scary. Change is scary for any human. Sometimes you don't feel as alone when you find other people who understand where you're coming from. So then it, you know, they kind of like, they people start talking like, well, schools, it's a traditional place, you know, that's where their beliefs were taught. And now you're trying to tell me that that was all wrong? That, that can't be right. So any changes to the curriculum now 
for example, teaching practices that are met by resistance by those who view them as a threat to their way of life. That's scary for some people. Some view it as um, it's unnecessary, divisive, it's long ago. Don't need to worry about it, don't need to worry about it. But when we don't understand history and how these communities are and why they're affected the way that they are, that's where the divide happens and sometimes people feel like things are being forced down their throat. And isn't that interesting? Because when you look at, flip the coin there, going back to what I started with, I was learning as a small child that you've got to, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it because this is, you already got these things that are like, you've been marked as defected basically, right? So with the growing backlash, um, because now there is a lot of research, there's a lot of da data and science to prove this. We understand how the brain works. We understand how people work. We have studied it, right? So now it's not just because school told us that it's okay, so therefore it's okay. People now question that and that's good. We wanna be critically thinking about these things. If you're not thinking, then yeah, it's pretty easy to get comfortable. We do that in our own lives, right? So the backlash, um, you know, schools have just become a site of resistance and it is coming so fast. And we may be safe right now in New Jersey. And sadly, all it's gonna take is one, p one powerful position to change and then that gets taken away from us. That's crazy to me, as a person who is not from here or allowed to vote those people in. Um, so just, just imagine, just, just sit with that for a moment. Just sit with that. I don't wanna just break your souls about this either. You already know, everything's a little bit, it's crappy. You're learning about it, you're, you're studying it, you're writing things, you already know about it clearly because you're not, you know, it's not the first time you've heard this. It's not the first time that you've been exposed to it. And for a lot of you, it's probably not even the first time you've experienced it. So it's like, yeah, you're preaching to the choir. I already know. Oh, I know. I know. I know you know. So going, when we look at education, right, the reality is in New Jersey, um, what are the realities of stratified disparities in New Jersey schools? So like some other states, well, many other states, there are significant disparities in educational outcomes and opportunities across different socioeconomic and racial and ethnic groups. These disparities are related to the broader issue of stratification, which refers to the unequal distribution of resources, opportunities and power across different social groups. So one of those key realities of stratified dis disparities in New Jersey schools, right here, right here, um, is the achievement gap. The achievement gap between students from different racial e ethnic backgrounds, from socioeconomic backgrounds. In general, students from low um, economic families and students of color tend to have low academic achievement. I didn't just make that up. There's actual data out there. The Department of Education themselves have said this. There's reporting systems now, so it's not like somebody just came in, made it up, and you know, there it is. The dropout rate is so much more higher for these students. Um, there's less access to advanced coursework and college prep programs, right? They're actually, you know, compared to um, more sort of affluent, more white counterparts. So for example, the data, again, going back to the data, I've got it up here. High school graduation rates for students is approximately 90% across the whole state. Now, when you look at the data for black, Hispanic and Latinx students, the graduation rate goes down to 80 to 82%. That is really big drop, really big drop. And we're not talking about like, you know, um, the stock market going up and down. We're talking about children. We're talking about 
where we started, how we started as children, right? We're talking about our babies. We're talking about our future leaders. We're talking about the people, the little people that are watching the craziness right now who aren't necessarily maybe not understanding it at this moment, like I didn't understand it back then, but all these years later, it made sense. I was like, oh, oh, is that what I want to do? No. So when we keep this knowledge out of schools, right, we release these little reports and then we stay distracted with something that's happening in the news because that's what mainstream media wants you to look at. They want you to look at certain things. They don't need to respond. They don't, they don't necessarily, because there's no call for accountability, right? But then how can you call for accountability when you're still learning yourself how big of and deep this really goes within New Jersey's public education system? So, you know, there's a variety of um, you know, disparities right here, unequal distribution of resources and funding. So I'm going to use my experiences from another country just to make this make sense. I don't need to move out of my town where in back home because we've all got access to the same curriculum. My teacher doesn't have to rely on parents being able to provide supplies to me in class because the, the government pays for that what they're supposed to do. Um, they don't need to worry about if they're in an area where your taxes are going to cover getting these kids to school on a bus. It doesn't work that way over there. I can live here and it may not be the best area, but I'm getting exactly the same curriculum and the same access to these fancy folk over here. So when I came here and I had my first child, Yay, we have an American, little American. He's born in Philadelphia. Apparently that's nothing to be proud of, but cool. <laughs> I didn't understand when he was about three or four years old, people said, you should probably look at like the school district ratings. And that's what, and I was like, what do you mean? And that was mind blowing. Now, I feel like I can't, you know, I feel like I've come from a place where I come here with my own privilege. I've come here because I have access to education back home. I had access to being able to fairly, again, get into college, even though I may not have come from money. You know, I'm, I'm first born, like first born in Australia. My parents are migrants from Fiji. Dad came over to Australia because he was mad at his dad. I'm just going to get on a plane and go to Australia from Fiji. Okay, dad. Um, so he can never question anything I do, which is great. But my point is, he actually walked in to the immigration office, said, okay, um, this isn't about night, like the 1970s and said, yeah, so um, I'm here and I want to be a citizen, make me Australian. And they did. So a couple of years later, he went back and he met my mum. Oh, and my mum married dad and, you know, they came, she then had to wait for her visa and they came over to Australia to start their new life because there's an Australian dream, just like there's an American dream, right? And they come with all these hopes and dreams and they're excited and, you know, the access is just going to be so much better. The education system and this and that and, you know, and so then the reality strikes is like, oh, okay, but you know what? At least the kids still have access to the same education. So their goal in life was to work their butts off to make sure that their children could get this education and to land opportunities um, like this right now. Never thought I'd be on the other side of the world presenting to your classroom in New Jersey. Just, just never imagined it, right? There are people who live here right in this, this, probably in this town that we're in, who've never left the town, who've never gone over to New York because it's just, they just don't. And I'm like, you've never been to New York? Like, it's New York. Because I now understand it's related to access. It's related to education. It's related to what is available to them 
and it started back in school. It started in school. So the data's there, right? We know that, we see it, but they don't necessarily, they wanna make you believe that we're doing some things. So then they try, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna start this thing, it's gonna be called the Amistad Commission. Has anyone heard of the Amistad Commission? Yeah, all right, cool, we're familiar with it. So that, I, from what I understand, was um, introduced almost like 22 years ago. 22 years ago, I was very young. Life was very different. And that you're telling me that that still doesn't necessarily get taught in classrooms, but it's like so simple. And it's limited to one subject, one subject. And 22 years later, we're still trying to figure out right here in New Jersey, how to teach American history. Why is that? Do you think it's because of resources? Do you think it's because they're not pouring it where it needs to go? But guess what? You wanna go play a sport? Got you. Make sense? When we continue to let these things slide and we keep asking all the other things, then the what aboutism comes in. And we, and we all know about that. So overall, the reality is it's complex. There's, you know, it's complex, it's multifaceted and they're rooted in a much broader societal related you know, or issues related to racism, poverty, and equality. They require systemic solutions. Now, it might look really great on paper, and I'm gonna tell you, based on my experience, when I tried to address this, I discovered that there's a real disconnect from the Department of Education to the school district of that county, to then to the school, to then, there's, there's all these little layers here, to then the child. Why is it so hard to, what, yet, yet, the justice system, really not that hard. Like the judge says, this is what's happening, that's it, boom, life is over. So it goes straight down. So how, where, why did this become so complicated? What would happen if we actually taught American history? Do you think people might actually have access to things? Do you think that there would be people that want to now speak up and, and really push for this? Because like enough's enough, right? The whole world's watching and it's, it's getting uncomfortable. And there are people that are going, we're working on it. We have this Amistad Commission. That's really great. But again, it goes back to the purpose. It goes back to the meaning. It connects there. I know this sounds really depressing. I can guarantee and, you know, um, not tied to anything, but I did have a meeting with some very um, higher up people in the Department of Education through my nonprofit asking these questions. Because from what I'm hearing, in the community, I didn't learn that. I did not learn that. I never learned that. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'm like, so there's this commission, like there's this law and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, that's not what happened. And then teachers start coming out going, listen, I'm not tenured. I'm not, um, you know, I can't like lose my job. I can't take the risk, but it's definitely not happening. I can guarantee you that. And it's all based on like the school and the demographics of that school and what the focus is and what the parents want because they're the ones paying the taxes. So there's a control issue now too. So you have a whole variety of things here. And this is really depressing. And I, I know, sorry, you know this. So what do we do about it? One of the examples that I got, um, well, there's a pandemic and we don't have the budget. We don't have the budget for this stuff. So try to speak out by raising awareness, right? They always say the first thing is you raise awareness. So how am I gonna do this? I have chosen to live here. I've chosen to put my child through this education system. How am I gonna do this? All right, so let's raise some awareness. Let me tell you, when you live in a town um, that I feel that I've tricked into moving in because of the school district before 2020, 
Um, speaking out on these type of things in a town where your demographics do not reflect people of colour, minorities, LGBTQ, like I'm talking, you know, well and truly over 80% white, historically known to be a town. But I find all this out six months into being there. All right, well, I'm not gonna just, I can't just move again. I wish I had that luxury, but I don't. So what are we gonna do? I, I raised awareness. Oh, that did not work at all. I got a target on my back and, you know, it, it should have been enough to say, shall I just sit down, just, just chill, it's, it's okay, just stay out of it. And you can't even vote here, what do you care? You haven't even got a grid, this is back then. And then I thought, no, 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 no. There's definitely something wrong here because even when I remember my experience of giving birth to my child and I'm always seen as, going back to why I didn't want to go through my bio, which is there, I have to dress a certain way. My makeup and my hair has got to be on point for me to even be acknowledged to walk into a room. So imagine when you're walking in, about to give birth, not looking your best, with this accent that is, oh my God, so cute. Don't you just want to wrap her up and take her home and just listen to her all day? And I'm like, mm, okay, okay. Uh, um, I'm sorry, but like as, as a person that, you, you know, the, I'm that a little offensive. I know I have a cool accent, apparently, because you guys make me feel really good about it. So thanks, but it's not cute. It's who I am, it's my identity, right? So when I'm seeing how I was treated, I, everything starts making sense in my head. And I'm like, but, okay, so where are the people? Where, where, like, where is like, you know, we're back home, there's ways to do this, you know, like if there's corruption, then like you get the queen involved because it's like the Commonwealth and you have the, you know, the Royal Commission come in and they do their inquiry. And it's like, yeah, this is, um, this is America. We have constitution here. I'm like, oh, okay. So how do we change that? Oh, we don't. What do you mean we don't? Like even we adjusted things and deleted things and rewrote things. And like this is the Commonwealth, like the grand, you know. So I'm sorry, I've got a lot of questions at this point. Now, when you're engaging in these conversations, I'm like, okay, well, so where do you go? Okay, you gotta go to policy makers. You've gotta go to the educators. You gotta go to community. So we gather and we talk we start supporting each other and we amplify those voices just like we saw in 2020. So this was happening though long before 2020. We know that in the civil rights movement. We like to, um, there are people who will celebrate Martin Luther King Day like the police department and talk about, you know, it's about service. Sir, your people used to arrest him. He was an activist, he was a troublemaker, but because he's dead and gone, he's not a problem anymore. And this comes back to the performative measures of land acknowledgement about really being woke. So when, it, when you think about it, it really does prove that if you really are woke, you're not either red or blue or whatever else there is here. Um, I've just learned about voting stuff here as well. Again, very interesting. How does that then affect education? Oh, it's all tied in. It is definitely tied in. So I took a leap. I am a social worker by background. Now, anyone who is a social worker, anyone who deals with humans, just out of the goodness of their heart, they understand when I say, it will always call you back. Right before the pandemic, I was like, that's it, I am done. They don't respect social workers here. They don't pay them enough, cool. I'm become a realtor, I'm gonna sell houses and make money and be rich, it's the American dream. And I'm like watching and I'm like, ah, oh, just don't, no, no, no. So I'm about to do this course and then like the, the world shuts down. I'm like, oh, I can't do the course, okay. So I'm like, distract, 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 okay. Started making some masks, because that's what you do, right? Well, I can't help it now, I really, really, just want to rip the band-aid off. So I start teaching myself, I start learning, I start looking and I start asking questions and I'm finding I'm getting more barriers than anything. So at this point, it's kind of like 
these are supposed to be the things that I'm supposed to tell you that's going to make you feel better. So you should just go and do what I did and open a nonprofit and go and ask all the hard questions. But I'm not going to tell you to do that. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy to do that, right? Because we don't all have these resources. I certainly don't. Our nonprofit certainly doesn't either. However, with our expertise, with our knowledge, we're able to provide at least something. And we're not just going to be like, we're going to talk about your personal implicit bias. Because that's all well and good, and yes, it's important. However, how does that change things? How is that going to address the system? So, in hindsight, there are ways to do it. We all kind of need to like come, come together a, a little bit better, right? There's no such thing as singular activism anymore. So we can't just go, I'm really woke because I support the LGBT community, but I can't like, I still think that, you know, it's like, you can't really say Black Lives Matter. So, no, you can't do that because it's intersex, right? We know that now because there are people of colour who belong to that community too, who then, ha it's like layers and layers and layers of like, why are we going to keep you at the bottom? So fighting out of that. Now, I can use my voice for somebody that may feel safe bringing that information to me and then I'll go find out for you. So I started doing that in the community and I started to become a bit of a local complaints department. Some of it was completely irrelevant, but I did it. And I did it because I just, I can't help it. It's just what a social worker just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's like a cult I've joined and I can't get out of it. And I probably never will and I'm okay with that. But I'm gonna use what resources that I have and my resource is my voice. My resource is the knowledge that I have bought from another country. It's the resources I'm linking with other people, right? I want to learn more and keep learning more. So when I talk about advocating for policies and programs, um, promoting equity and justice in education, like really get in there, okay? You can't just sign up and then back away, okay? We're tired, people are tired. I keep hearing that from activists, we're really tired. We've gone generations of fighting this. It really, really, really is the time for all of us to just sort of come together because when we keep different groups apart, they're less powerful. So we're pinned against each other, right? Now, I also understand that, like, and I had knowledge that I do come here with a level of privilege because where I'm from, I had that access, right? So I know that I don't have all these student debts until I'm, I don't know, 60 because the system over there just works for you to, I guess, succeed somewhat. Don't get me wrong, Australia is far from perfect. However, they've made some, some changes. There is definitely a long way to go and I will leave that for another time. But when it comes to education, we really need to be starting with our babies. And I'm not talking about AP classes, I'm not talking about um, in the eighth grade and middle school, I'm talking about the babies. Right, it starts from before they get out into the world. Okay, I, from what I understand here, you, we now are allowed to have these conversations and it, it all makes sense, you know, you're prepping your children before they get into the classroom. Because you know, as an adult, that they're gonna be exposed to certain things because it's been your experience, it's been what you've witnessed. It's what history has shown us. So you can't turn a blind eye to it anymore at this point. So what is it that you're gonna do to help move that needle? And it could be something so simple of just supporting these organizations, supporting these individual people, bringing them together, just connecting two people. And then they go off and do what they gotta do. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But together, when you brainstorm, like in you know those fun group projects, it kind of comes together in the end, right? And right now, we unfortunately have to really hold accountable a scary system. And it is scary. And yes, I do have a target on my back. But you know what? How many people did they do this to over the years? How many people 
so many people and they're scared and they go, you know what, like, I, this is getting really personal now. Unfortunately um, for them, you, I'm sure you're watching, um, I'm not afraid. It actually excites me because you're giving me more ammunition. You, you're allowing me to use my experience and my knowledge and then bring that together and show you the evidence, right? So here's what I tried to do. I just pulled together. I found out that every second person in America owns a nonprofit and you could just do that here. That's amazing. You can't do that where I'm from. I was like, I'm gonna own my own nonprofit. I'm gonna, yeah, cool. Um, parents not that big of a deal, but my parents are really proud, so we're going to stick to that. Um, I'm using education to help propel that change, but I'm also using human connection, something that I think a lot of us have forgotten because that's what we've been taught to. We've been t we we've forgotten to hold the door open sometimes. Yes, I'm, we're, we're there, we are there, I know. How did you all get through that with my voice for this long? Well done. So my point though is, as I wrap this up, is that it's all about community, okay? It's a community of wherever you go. It's in your family, it's then your neighbors, it becomes a village. And the village is us and we're responsible to make sure our children don't go through this. Families have been fighting for so long, so long. And maybe my ancestors weren't from America, but everyone's got their story and everyone's got their history. And it doesn't matter who had it worse. The reality is that right now, there are two specific groups that are very targeted. And we're all responsible to bring that together because when we bring in all these other, like, you need to wait, you need to wait, you need to wait. Well, what about, what about, no, no, no. You're just gonna have to wait. We'll get there. So now is the time to really hold your elected officials accountable, all of them, local, state, so county, all of them. Because when I tell you that this is all linked to our education system, it really is, it really, really is. And when it, when it, it, it really does make sense when you start looking into it a little deeper, and I'm sure you've got that perspective just from this course alone. It's not going to be easy. You will be, you know, there'll be moments where you're kind of like, oh, what am I doing, you should stop, but like, people like me don't stop, I just don't. I should, but I don't. So I hope that I haven't just, you know, destroyed your optimism. I do hope that you have taken something out of that and that really is the power of your own voice however you do it just be something so simple but it will make a difference just do it that's all i really want to say and so saying that if you're still awake and i did see a couple of you kind of close your eyes i'm just going to say that you were meditating and i'm cool with that mm -hmm. i used to meditate a lot in college too um please ask any questions does anyone have anything that they want to add? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am native. This is the first time that I have ever experienced an actual land acknowledgement outside of our community. And I wanted to tell you how much that that meant to me to see someone actually use it correctly was incredible. So uh, I will have to uh, hobble, but <laughs> I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that. See the power of the voice, everyone. <laughs> power of the voice. Anyone else? Any other takers? So mine is a little bit more of a question for like my own personal interest. So I'm a student in the diversity and inclusion master's program, but I'm also the chair of the psychology department um, and do some research on disparities in higher education. Yep. Um, so if somebody wanted to reach out to you to continue a discussion to see what you all do and um, all of that, how would we go about doing that? So um, it was actually on the last slide, um, but I can definitely um, make sure that you every, and all the attendees receive um, contact information. You can check us out on 
D-E-O-N, the number four, change.org, Dion for change.org. But I'm here as an individual, just so you know, um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation. Thank you. I guess like aside from the entire presentation, I just have to say for one, thank you. Thank I you. learned a lot. And um, I mean, everyone in my like cohort knows like my personal perspective, like my thesis and what I want to do is basically on education. Um, so hearing you, I was like, this is great. This is such a great foundation for this paper that we have to write for this class. Um, so I just followed you on Instagram. I just found your, found your website. So I'm very excited because yes. it's the same thing what Lisa said. Um, if there's any opportunities, I definitely would like to Absolutely. You can also find see. me on LinkedIn. Oh, perfect. Yes, just look up my name um, that you all forgot, right? What's my name? No one around. Shelja. Shelja. There we go. Good stuff. <laughs> no, not soldier. I am a soldier, though. Any other questions? Nothing on the chat. We're all good. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you.